So we're walking through the book of Philippians. It has an overarching theme of the fellowship of the gospel. Understanding the fellowship is what it is to be shoulder to shoulder with one another for one common goal, one common purpose. This common goal and this common purpose specifically is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That is our calling. That's what we're called to do. It's who we are to be, uh, what we are to be about, and making sure that our community and those around us know all about Jesus Christ. And so that's what the, the life of the church is about. It's kind of what we talked about last week. Uh, we have a theme that was the lifeblood of the church is seen in the unity and care that we have for one another. We were walking through this in our uh, Discovering Grace um, new members class of what it, how people will know the good news of Jesus Christ is when they see us unified and for the betterment of mutual care for one another. It's an incredible testimony that when we show those things to one another. We are uh, that lifeblood that is the church. And uh, we see that unity and care of the church as we uh, look as we look at one another as the family of God. Uh, like it or not, <laughs> we are a part of this body and we are to be a part of one another's lives. So that's what we talked about last week. This week we're diving into the humility of Jesus. And so when you, we break down this section of chapter 2 verses 5 to 8, you're going to see uh, no greater example than the humility of Jesus. And that's our theme this morning, is there is no greater ex example of humility than Jesus. When you open up into the book of Matthew, uh, it, you can turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, but as we are looking into uh, the book of Matthew, you see this um, towards the end of Jesus' ministry, you see this, uh, this really ugly spirit develop with some of the disciples. And you see this, this connection as this development has happened within the disciples and how when James and John, um, they uh, decide that they want Jesus to promise them privileged sides of the throne in heaven. And that's an ugly spirit. Like, who are we to say, hey, you know, Jesus, when I get to heaven, can I sit at your right side? Because, you know, like, I'm better than everybody else. So, and then, you know, my brother can have the left side, you know, like we can have that type thing. So they have this, they are asking for that. And, and it says in, in chapter 20, verses uh, 24 to 28, when, when they heard of this, specifically the 10, the other 10 disciples, they were indignant with their two brothers. And so there were harsh words coming about. There were angry emotions within the other 12, with all these 12 together, and, and tempers flared. So Jesus called them together and shares this, verses 25 to 28. He says this, uh, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now at this point, you and I would think, all right, well, obviously they got it. Clearly, Jesus shared it very bluntly that you cannot be greater than me, all right? They, they heard this truth, but you and I both know that sometimes hearing the truth and making it a part of our lives are two separate things. We can hear the truth, but not apply it to our lives. And so even if we're devoted followers of Jesus, we know that these two things are separate. Several days later, the apostles arrived in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. You know, remembering back into Exodus and, and where, where God saved the Israelites for those that marked their doorways with the blood of a lamb, a pure lamb. And so the spirit of death went over. And, and for those that didn't mark their doors, that, they, um, that their child, firstborn was, chilled, was killed. And so they celebrate those that were saved during this Passover time. And so here they are. They're remembering this incredible act of what God had done. And so this is what this time represents, remembering what God has done. Okay, so remember that. 
Peter and John had, were supposed to go uh, secure this room so that they could spend um, some time with Jesus and celebrating the Passover. But they forgot to make arrangements. They forgot to make the arrangements uh, for foot washing. So again, within the culture, every time they went into a room, again, they're walking around with, with sandals. And, and so when they come into a room, their feet are dirty, right? They're just disgusting. So they remember that when they walk in, that there's going to be a slave that there's going to be there and is going to wash their feet in order for them to be able to sit down at the table, um, pure, cleansed, right, before the Lord and celebrate Passover. But again, Peter and John forgot to make those arrangements. And, and so the apostles, they all came in. But no one was willing to humble themselves and wash the other's feet. So they, they were not thinking just two days before this, Jesus said, so didn't the Son of Man come to serve, not to be served, but to serve two days before this, right? This is like being a parent, right? Don't you remember when I said this? Jesus is teaching just two days before that no one's willing to volunteer for the lowliest of tasks. Ooh, volunteerism. Yeah, it's in the Bible. All right? It's supposed to be part of our lives. I won't jump on that yet. Here we go. So they're, they're showing their humanness, right? That's just like us. And so here in the Gospel of John, we know that this account was taken, what happened behind closed doors. And so the disciples are all reclining at the table, right? They're reclining at this table. When you think of reclining, we think they're relaxed, but their feet are all nasty. And they're sitting at the table dirty. But no one, and, and so no one is willing to, to wash these, each other's feet. So... They're sitting in the filth of each other. And so as they're there with their dirty feet stretched out behind them, the meal was in process. This wasn't before. They were eating dirty. And as the conversation was filled with tension, they're remembering what the Passover was about. They're supposed to be. Now we could look at them and be like, those idiots. Why didn't they get two days before they knew this? Oh, don't judge. Don't judge. Right? Because man, if I were a disciple, I would probably be sitting there with dirty feet. Then they became aware that Jesus was standing, watching them eat. And as he was standing apart from them, they turned and they watched as Jesus removed his outer garment, went over to the basin, filled it with water, and began to wash each one's feet individually. Now you and I can just imagine, it was dead silent, just like this that you could hear the drops of water as he's pouring over their feet and taking his outer garment and washing their feet. I can only imagine them just being, what have we done? Look at what my own sin, look what my own pride has done that God in human form is now washing my feet. You could probably hear the, the wiping as he's taking the towel over their feet. You could probably even hear Jesus be breathing as he's doing this. They were all probably remembering the old Hebrew teaching that no Hebrew, even a slave, are allowed to wash feet. That's what they're holding to. They're holding to an old Hebrew teaching rather than what the Savior of the world is doing right in front of them. Yet Jesus did this in the most humble and broken of places 
realizing in this moment of silence in the upper room as they're hearing the trickle of water being poured, the friction of the towel, and the sound of the teacher breathing. The incarnate Son of God Himself was dressed like a servant and washing the feet of His pride-filled, arrogant creatures. And his response is this in John 13. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have sent, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So at this very moment, as Jesus is speaking, he's not shaming them. He's not saying, how dare you not do this? How dare you forget to set up what had taken place, what you should have had done? He's not shaming them. He says, what I just did, I want you to do for one another. How? In humility. There is no greater example of humility than Jesus. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. See, our tendency is to be self-centered. We find it difficult to live out Jesus' directives. And Paul even advised the Philippians, as we talked about last week, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value your others above yourselves. Not looking to your interests, your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. See, humility and others' directedness are hard for us. We find it difficult in the most important of relationships, both in our homes and in our churches. We've talked about this for the past few weeks, that Paul calls us to live worthy of the gospel. You understand that worthy of the gospel is not something I can attain. It's something that I can grasp and hold on to because of what he's done. As we turn to this incredible example of Jesus in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, theologically, this is the Christological centerpiece of this entire book. Christological meaning the greatest and the most of the understanding that we can have of Christ himself comes in this passage. And it's the centerpiece of this entire book and is central to the entire New Testament. So when we reread this passage, it takes us down this picture of Christ's humility, how he was humbled, and then he rises to be exalted. So this morning, as we look at this first half, referring to the pre-existent Christ's self-humiliation, may it be an example for our own hearts as we dive specifically. Look at verse 5. It says this. In your relationships with one another, have the mindset of Christ Jesus. So you'll see there's a semicolon at the very end, and it's going to show us what that mindset of Christ Jesus is. But he says something before that. In your relationships with one another. Literally, it means above, among yourselves, which also in Christ Jesus, have this mindset. You see, it's this picture that Paul's saying in, to the Philippians was not for them to have the same minds as far as the interactions, but he's referring to the whole congregation. He's saying, all of you look at it this way. To live out Jesus' mindset in relationship is what he's saying. That same humble attitude of Jesus. It boils, everything boils down and starts in verse 5. Have this mindset. So let's take a look at Jesus' humility here this morning. The first, you can see it in three different ways. So within the humility of Jesus, the first way we see this is Jesus' humility in heaven in verse 6. 
So as we see this, verse 6 says this, Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So the first way that we see this is within his own existence. And so Jesus existed in his form of God through all eternity and shares in the glory of God. So Jesus alluded to this in the upper room in his priestly prayer on the night of his death in John 17, 5. It says this, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. The glory that Christ had before the world may seem unreal like in its own reality for us to like we can't comprehend this majesty but we see that Jesus we can even say that Jesus is the light of lights but not really grasp it into its understanding of what it means that Jesus is the light of lights meaning he's the central theme to all light we can't grasp that this is why it's more, it, it brings about some challenges when we read this about Jesus, because our minds can't comprehend the realities of his person. That's why it's in debate and has been in debate for many, many years of who is really Jesus. Paul brings it up and is, describes his character, his humility specifically. But to grasp his existence, you know, I remember thinking when I was a child, and even I say as a child, I think even now, trying to comprehend before the world began, he was. I'm finite, he's infinite. I'm not going to be able to understand this. He is, and he will be. Amen. At the same time, the form of God does not refer simply to his external appearance, but his being. Hebrews 1.3 says this, I love this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. See, note here, this is, this is important for us to recognize, note here that Jesus is not merely the reflector of God's glory. He is the radiance of the one who radiates the glory of God. He shines forth his own essential glory. You know, along with what the Father and the Son and the, the mystery of the Trinity is, he is the radiance of God's glory. Again, radiance is what I think about when Moses walks down off Mount Sinai. He's just glowing. Like, like that's, I think of radiance. It's just, it's just what exudes off of him because he experienced the presence of God. Jesus is the presence of God. And he's going to radiate that wherever he went. That's why people were so uncomfortable with his own existence. The second thing is this. Within the humility, Jesus' humility in heaven is his attitude. And whoo, this is where it really hurts, right? There's this wonder that enters in because of this eternal humility in heaven. Though he existed in the splendor of the nature of God, he did not consider that something that we could even understand. He, did, he, he said, you're not going to be able to understand this. And I know you won't be able to understand it. But the idea behind it did not hold to his equality with God to be something we could understand. But go back to verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2 of Philippians, where it talks about that do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's what he's talking about. But do everything you do, do for others. That's Jesus' attitude. Everything you do, do it for others so that we could understand that. You see, we as Christians, if we become rivals over things of our own self-interests, we're wrong. And we're not exuding that relationship that God desires us to have. 
Jesus is the complete opposite of such people. You see, rather than viewing his equality with God, something to keep, he saw it as a qualifying him for his humble coming down to save these people, his descent into these people. It's, what he's saying is this picture of his willingness. Like, think about it. The fact that he came from the right hand of the throne of God to get in the muck and the mire of your and my realities so that you and I might experience favor and he still gets glory. Now, it's interesting. We often say, well, if we're doing that, then we're giving God more glory. God doesn't get more glory from us. He already has glory. He gets more glory from us. But His glory, His majesty is still there. It's just like whether you and I acknowledge Him as Lord doesn't take away from Him being Lord. He's still Lord. But we now acknowledge Him as Lord. We acknowledge His glory. This picture of his attitude, he was willing to humble himself from heaven. And it, it causes us to just wonder about the majesty of God, the majesty of Jesus himself. And so in that, when he came to this earth, he came as the incarnation, right? So the second thing we see is Jesus' humility and in incarnation. So incarnation, again, is God in human form, like coming down in human form, in the form of Jesus. So we're looking at this, of, of what this entails. So Jesus' humility and, and heaven is, not, is next, followed by the humility of the incarnation. And what it means is, again, human flesh that God puts on. Verse 7 says, Rather he made himself nothing by t taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now, there's two ways that we see this taking place. First is through his emptying. Now, there's, there's a lot of, been a lot of debate over the, in the 20th century, specifically within theologians, about this emptying. And it's often abused by saying that he emptied himself, therefore he ceased to be God. And that's not true. That's not true at all. When he emptied himself, he, he stripped himself, or it, didn't, it also doesn't mean that he stripped himself of his attributes. Like, it's still, he's still God. Right? This, this, has been, this theory has been thrown away and, and abused and because of what has taken place. And again, just going to little nerd out on you a little bit here. Because of the four of the five uses of the verb in emptying in the New Testament, they're all metaphorical. So just to let you, it's just metaphor. When he emptied himself, it wasn't fig, like it was figuratively. Just because of, I mean, he emptied himself of being at the right hand of God, right? He's no longer there. He is here, right? So we have to understand this. He took on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Jesus takes what this negative action of actually what it means to empty is actually defined by Jesus in a positive way when he came down into our world as the incarnate God. Right? So there's two ways that we see this is the emptying by taking the form of a servant. So that's empty. When you're God, you're the creator, you were there at the beginning and you'll be there at the end and you're willing to get into the muck and the mire to be a servant for us? That doesn't make sense. That's empty. See, here the word is the same sense in the verse 6, which is, signifies both the appearance and being of God. So when Christ took on the form of a servant, he adopted the appearance specifically of becoming a slave. And so taking on this emptying as Christ so dramatically demonstrates and strips himself and, and shows, like strips himself literally of his outer garment, that's what we're referring to, in the upper room, he washes his disciples' feet. Christ did not exchange his form of God for being the form of a slave. Rather, he showed what it looks like to be the form of God in the form of a slave. 
I know it's, a, it's very wordy. I want us to gra- try to grasp a hold of that. He f- emptied himself by becoming the form of a servant, in emptying his rightful place at the right hand of God. And secondly, uh, he emptying by being born in the likeness of man. See, the other phrase that we see here identifies the emptiness by being in, born in the likeness of man, describes his full identity with the human race. That's, that's where you and I can like come alongside it and understand and read and, and view Jesus as, well, he dealt with what I dealt with. He, he walked through temptation. He walked through brokenness of man. He walked through differing of opinions. He, he walked through all these things. Because he was born in the likeness of man. So he fully participated in the human experience be, tr- being truly man, but not merely man. See, Christ never was, never because of, of his humility, it was be, it's this picture of he is the genesis and the epitome of humility. He's the beginning. He's, he's the author of it. Because when we look at this humility, that's who Jesus is. I know these concepts are really hard to comprehend. And I pray that as, as you, listen, go back and reread this and you even re-listen to this. Try to grasp this whole with a fresh eyes and receive these truths. Because what it does is it changes the whole spiritual wonder of the realities of who Jesus is when we grasp the understanding of him emptying himself of his rightful place and becoming like you and me. I was even, I was telling Mike this week as we were in the office, I was like, I'm not smart enough that, like, what the last two passages before we walk through Passion Week is the definition of Jesus and, like, who Jesus was. And then starting the following week is going to be Palm Sunday and then going into Good Friday and going into Easter. I'm not that smart. I'm, God did that on his own, right? So when we get done with walking through this passage, we walk into the Passion Week. I'm not that smart. God is that good, right? So what a beautiful way of being able to understand these concepts as we look at it together. Thirdly is this, is Jesus' humility and death in verse 8. Jesus came to this earth and it bottoms out here. Like bottoms out, kind of like what you all do when you drove a car for the first time at 16. You bottom out somewhere, right? You get in the air and you, okay, nobody else? Okay, just me. All right. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, his human form and more exactly his human shape was this visible appearance of a man, though those who saw Christ saw him as a man, but he fully identified himself with humanity. And so how do we know this? How do we see that? Well, we see it here in the first way is this, is through his self-humbling. And so this is vital This is important that we understand this about Jesus. Specifically, this is like the whole attestment of who the humility of Jesus or what the epitome of humility of Jesus looks like. Because he self-humbled himself. Meaning he was a real man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. This is where Jesus stands differing than you and I. This is where he would stand if, because are we willing to give our lives for all humanity? The answer to that is most likely not. But then how did he do it? He humiliated himself to where they were spitting on him. They put a thorn crown on his head and dug it into his scalp. They flogged him to the point of his organs being viewed in his back. He humiliated himself. But the infinite difference between Christ and ourselves is this, that 
In every humiliation which he suffers, it is necessary that he himself could confirm that he was willing to submit to that humiliation. And so what does that show you and I? He has superiority over suffering. He has all authority over it because he's the creator. And he was willing to do that for you and for me. The infinite, just this infinite suffering becomes even more intense and even more kind when we realize that he self humbled himself. And it goes back, we go back to verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2 in Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking out for the interests of your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Jesus' self-humiliation brought the ultimate obedience by becoming obedient to the point of death. And we remember this and we see this when we go to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before his death. Do you guys remember that, that the dialogue that he had with his father? Check this out, right? It took, he took on the wrath of God and he heard him. He said, he said in Mark 14, 34, he says this, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, he, stay here and keep watch. So he says this to those disciples that are with him. Most likely Peter, James, and John. They fall asleep because they're punks, right? But you and I would have fallen asleep too. Anyway, Luke chapter 22, verses 43 and 44, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. That's right. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Previous verse in verse 42, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. His self-humiliation meant to the obedience, full obedience, even to his death. Because the second thing we see within this humility and death is we see his death. And then he died the most terrible of deaths, even death on a cross. You see, humanity had not created a more degrading experience than the cross. In fact, in Roman society, it, the consideration of mentioning the cross was an obscenity. If you were to mention the cross, it was mentioned like a curse word. And we know that because it took... Many, 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 many more years before Christians used that as the symbol. And in fact, it became the symbol. You know, many of us might have a cross around your neck. You know how much later in life it took before culturally that became accepted? Because for how many people would keep an obscenity wrapped around their neck? That's why it became such a symbol. Because of what Christ was willing to do for you and for me. Even death on the cross is this crowning expression of humble obedience. John Calvin writes this, For by dying in this way, he was not only covered with shame in the sight of men, but also accursed in the sight of God. It was assuredly such an example of humility as ought to absorb the attention of all men. It is impossible to explain it It is in words suitable to its greatness. The humblest of men who ever lived is Jesus himself, God, man. Think about it who being the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. How should we respond to the humility of Jesus? Go back to verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This morning as an application, think about it in this way. It's just twofold, and it goes along with verses 3 and 4. It's first is to serve others. We talk about it every single week. But I pray that as we look to the life of Jesus, that's why we serve others. He's our example. He's the greatest example. And then secondly, to look out for the interests of others. Going back to why. Because we look at the life of Jesus. John 13, Jesus, we'll close with this, says this. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do it as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him.